So my uh, software project for this morning was uh, to finish up the tr stabilization. If you, uh, I want to be careful with the word stabilization, and it's only borderline appropriate, but for the perching example. And maybe we can start the discussion by sort of making sure we appreciate uh, how important and how it plays out in, um, you know, is adding control around trajectories in the context of the perching example. So <clears throat> let me start by pulling up my perching notebook here. So the trajectory optimization, I actually, it's funny because in order to make the whole pipeline work, um, I had to tweak my trajectory optimization too. So I've got a slightly different perching trajectory now that is uh, optimized more carefully. So basically, uh, <clears throat> my original trajectory optimization problem, I had 10, uh, 20 time steps that spanned over the 0.7 seconds or whatever of the, of the perching trajectory. And the dynamics were not satisfied accurately enough with those 20 time steps. And I had to do a little bit more work to make it sure it, it could so it could work with about 41 time steps in order to get the, the rest of the pipeline to work, to get the, all the stabilization to work and everything to balance. So it's a slightly different trajectory than I've shown you before. It's still perching, still cool. I added the, the, the perch so we can see where it, what's happening there. Okay, but that's, <clears throat> again, just a slightly refined version of what you've seen before. Um, Let me run that again just so you can see the actual optimization happening, right? Just you can watch the trajectory optimization happening. You know, it pretty quickly converges on a nice perching trajectory. Okay. Now, one of the questions we got when we started talking about trajectory optimization is, uh, is this, are these solutions stable, right? If, can I even execute them? And it turns out that in my, you know, 41 samples evenly spaced along this trajectory, if I were to draw the actual sample points, I've added a constraint saying the time can scale, but it needs to be evenly spaced along the, along the trajectory. If I just take that U trajectory, U over time, and I put it back and I run a simulation, then what happens in the perching example here, but in many examples? So that's what the perching trajectory looks like. That's what the control looks like, okay? The first thing I'm gonna do is just an open loop simulation. So I'll just take that same trajectory, I'll put it in exactly the same initial conditions I used for the, for the trajectory optimization, and I'll run simulate. And that's the uh, original, that's the desired trajectory, the one that was optimized by the optimizer, and this is the, uh, the rollout of actually running that open loop tape. Okay, so if I play it over here, it tries, but it just misses, right? What happened? It's exactly the same initial conditions. Why does the trajectory optimization not work? Why can I not simulate it back out? And this will happen to you. If, when you start using trajectory optimization, this is not like a artificially constructed example. What could it be? Yeah, but w which step is adding uh, room for numerical errors to creep in? What's different about the two? This is a direct collocation method, if that matters. Yeah. Okay, good. So there's, um, well, so, so he says the dynamics constraints are not imposed exactly. So, um, they are imposed in one way in direct collocation, which is saying that at the collocation points, the slope satisfies the dynamics. They're imposed a slightly different way. They're both trying to impose them, and they're both imposing them to some accuracy, but they are imposed a slightly different way in simulation. In simulation, at, every, at the beginning of every state, I evaluate the dynamics, and I do some integration-based numerical update. In fact, it's doing an error-controlled integration here, so it's actually simulating very accurately but it's a different integration scheme than the one that's implied by the trajectory optimization, and that's enough to just totally whiff, miss the perch completely. Right? This is 
This is a problem where the control authority is very, you're very much on the boundary of what you can do. So this ex maybe is an extreme example, but you will see like the Acrobat won't get to the top. You know, um, it's very common in under actuated systems. If you're fully actuated, right, and then you can, it's, uh, if you're a robot uh, arm, for instance, bolted to the table and you're moving around and you've planned a trajectory, you can execute that trajectory People will close, a, you know, the controller will close a feedback loop for you, but you know, that's not a problem when you're fully actuated. But when, the, when there's a more subtle control problem to handle, uh, trajectory optimization by itself is not enough. You need to do something else. Okay, so the answer is not hard. Um, we have the basic recipes for it, but we're gonna under, make sure we understand it and where it works and where it doesn't work, okay? Um, <clears throat> but basically you can do LQR along a trajectory, okay? What it means exactly to do LQR um, over a finite trajectory is, is one of the topics for today, okay? But if I do LQ, a finite horizon linear quadratic regulator on this um, perching example, I'll just run it again for, for grins, then not only does the original trajectory get to the perch, but it can even have a, a set of initial conditions that can get to the perch. Okay, it's not a global. If I so I if you, if we look at the code here, I took the the state from the trajectory. I know that's probably small, and you don't want to read the code, but um, I only made a s relatively small perturbation to the z position of the glider uh, for this. We can try other ones. X coming off at a different um, velocity was actually a pretty interesting one in lab because we had this, you know. Our launcher was a rubber band, basically, so it wasn't exactly precise in terms of its initial velocity. Oh, that was too simple. They all looked the same. Um, I can have it coming off at a slightly wrong angle or something. Let's make the numbers a little bigger. Those all worked. Pretty sure that's going to be too big. Okay, yeah. So. A couple of those got lucky and got to the perch, but the ones that started just way too high, just completely whiffed, okay? And that's an analog of what, you know, that's kind of what you'd expect. The same way we've said that linear control works to stabilize a fixed point in the area where the linearization is good, but if you move too far, then your linear approximation of the dynamics is no longer valid, okay? And you'll see that here. And of course, we're gonna be able to, we're gonna talk about even how do you certify the region where the linearization, the, the controller based on linearization can be valid for the nonlinear system. All those tools apply. There's some subtleties in making them apply, okay? So uh, let's dive in and, and sort of think, of, think that through. <clears throat> any, I mean, any questions about that before I do? I would actually say that this is, um, you know, when I was, when I first started as a faculty, I was like, oh, you know, the old guys do linear control and now we should do nonlinear control and linear control is no good and nonlinear control is the only thing. And this was the project where I was like, oh, linear control is pretty darn good actually. I should stop saying that and I should use it as much as I can and then try to push beyond it. Because you, I found, uh, we saw, I, I was, I, I hope I could find it, uh, this morning, I didn't find it yet, but there's, there are examples where the trajectory really comes out very different than the nominal trajectory, and the linear controller does an exceptional job of stabilizing it. Like, it will actually take corrective maneuvers. It will, you know, uh, when it's got too much uh, velocity, it'll actually, like, go up into the air in order to slow down, and, and, and you know, it, it doesn't, the linearization is actually a very informative summary of the dynamics and it can make, and the linear control can do non-trivial things over time to exploit that. At some point, it's not good enough. That's definitely true, but it's more powerful than I ever I had originally given it credit for. All right, so the picture you wanna um, have in your head about is, is sort of, is linearizing about a trajectory. What does it mean to linearize about a trajectory? Now you remember the, uh, 
original motivation I gave of the pendulum linearization, where if you linearized around a fixed point, you know, the true nonlinear vector field looked like this, and the linearization around the fixed point, which makes sense, you know, we, we understand all the, the tools from that, it's the Taylor expansion, you know, it did very well in the vicinity and only got bad somewhere else. Okay. So what happens if you were to, let's just forget about a trajectory first, let's just, what happens if you linearize but you pick some point that's not a fixed point? What would it mean to linearize around this? What happens to the machinery, right? Remember the, the machinery was just the Taylor approximation, right? So we basically, we said that this was approximately f of x zero, u zero, plus partial f of x, x minus x zero, right, where those are the linearization point, and these derivatives are evaluated at the nominal, right? And there's some, you can either say it's approximately equal to, or you could say it's exactly equal to this plus some higher order terms. I wrote approximately equal here, okay? So <clears throat> partial f, partial x, partial f, partial u, we know how to take those. The, they're straight out of the, in fact, they're, they're efficient to be taken for the manipulator equations, right? We talked about that. That works absolutely fine when you linearize around this point. You get a different value, but you still get a, a, a reasonable A and B matrices, if you will. The difference is this term is only zero if you're at a fixed point, right? So when you linearize around some other point, then you've got this, you don't get a linear system, you get an affine system. You know, this would be a constant. You get something that looks like x dot equals ax plus bu plus c, for instance. And the picture you should have in your head is that um, if I were to zoom in on that plot, right, the true vector field looks like this. And that affine approximation, that Taylor approximation, is going to do a pretty good job, right? It's going to be the, it's going to have some, it doesn't have to be straight lines. It can have a curvature. In fact, they, they often tend to be complex in parts of these coordinate systems. But it's going to make some uh, local approximation of, the, uh, of those nonlinear vector fields. And that's correct, but they're just not linear. They're affine. Because there's a, there's an, even at the origin, the value is not zero. Stabilizing these kind of systems, um, you know, takes, you have to, you have to do something else in order to make LQR work for that. <clears throat> the origin here is not clearly stabilizable. So here's the trick. It's not, a, I don't want to say it's a trick. Here's the natural solution to that problem that makes everything great, right? Is that we have to think about, instead of thinking about uh, linearizing around a point, we're going to linearize around a trajectory which makes effectively a moving coordinate system. So think about, you know, I've got some coordinate system here, and it's gonna, I want my coordinate system to ride along the trajectory as I'm moving along this trajectory. And the way that manifests itself in those equations <coughs> is 
it's going to be effectively the same thing. I'm going to say x dot is approximately equal to now a time varying trajectory that I'm going to linearize around. All the other stuff is the same. It just picks up this time dependence here. I want to make that explicit because you're going to see how it affects things in a second here. Oops. <clears throat> now, if x zero t u zero t is a feasible solution to the system, it's a trajectory of this dynamical system, That means it's consistent with the dynamics. That means that x0 dot of t <clears throat> right, that's, a, that's a valid solution to the differential equation. <clears throat> then I can really just think about this thing as x0 dot. And the way things become linear and good again is that I write my error coordinates <clears throat> and this is just, if I move this to the other side, x dot minus x zero dot is just x bar dot, right? So that thing becomes x bar dot equals a x bar plus b u bar with one important difference is that remember these things are evaluated at the linearization so this a matrix and B matrix depend on T. So I can get a linearization. It's linear, not affine anymore. I can imagine stabilizing it and doing other good things, but I know how to do with linear. Affine's not terrible. I don't mean to say that affine's terrible, but this is the form we like, right? <clears throat> the only big difference is that my Linearization is time varying. And the interpretation is that it's, it's the linearization in a moving coordinates that's moving along my trajectory. Right? The notion of the, the, the definition of x bar is time varying. Questions? Good? Yeah? I don't want that to just be algebra, but uh, Hopefully the idea works. <clears throat> okay, so um, guess what? It turns out we know a lot about how to, you know, a, the, a lot of the wealth of linear control and linear optimal control still applies even if A and B are time varying. That was a big surprise to me when I, when I first came across this. It was, I, I realized that, you know, I just assumed that, because you can, you can imagine putting pretty complicated systems into that form if you just suck the time dependence into AT and BT. So it's, it's pretty surprising, really, that linear control still can help. But um, it turns out if you go through the basic, you know, um, you go through the basic derivation for LQR, for instance, right, if I say I'm going to minimize um, the integral, even, well, let me do it for a finite horizon, because that's, I called it finite horizon on the screen there. <clears throat> right? Just shorthand that. Subject to 
x bar dot equals a of t x bar plus b of t u bar. If you write the Riccati equation out, you can still solve this. The solutions take on a different character, but you, the Riccati equation that we wrote down um, still works. <clears throat> you won't be surprised, maybe, that you could also, if you chose, you could choose Q and R to be time varying also. That doesn't add a ton of power, necessarily. Okay, so the machinery, I won't do the full derivation, but let me just accentuate the differences. So now I'm gonna have a cost to go, which is a function of x and t. And it turns out it's still gonna be a quadratic form, but a time varying quadratic form. Right? It's still quadratic, but it's a time varying quadratic. And you can still write u of t is, um, it actually, it's u0 of t minus k of t, x bar. The controller is still linear in the moving coordinate system. And then the solution to this equation, the Riccati equation, before, I'm gonna erase this zero in a second here, but before it was S A plus A transpose S plus, you know, or minus S transpose. I mean, it was just this, this thing that you should respect, but don't need to memorize, right? That was what it was before. Now, all these things are time varying, so that was a little bit different. I'll leave R and Q as constant for now. And what's interesting is that you get one more term, I'll show you where it comes from, which tells you how S changes over time. Okay, so this was zero on the other side, and now I get an S dot equals that right-hand side. This is called the differential Riccati equation. couple interesting properties of it, just so we, so we understand. So if I were to take Tf to infinity and make these all, remove the time dependence here, then there is one fixed, there's a, there's a one positive definite fixed point for this equation. That fixed point happens when the derivative equals zero and that's the algebraic Riccati equation that we know it from before. Everything is consistent. This is not breaking any of the existing rules, right? The steady state solution of these equations when it exists is the original infinite horizon LQR we talked about. But this is, in fact, this is a way, it's an inefficient way. If you wanted to try to find a steady state uh, solution, you could just simulate this and hope that that fixed point is stable. It's, most, it's often stable. There's cases where it's not, but my hand erased the dot, okay? But this is different now because this tells me a schedule how S changes over time. So as I move along the trajectory, my cost to go is a function of, it, it is a function of where I am on that trajectory. This extra term, if you're wondering where it came from, it came from the fact that when I write out the dynamics, or I write out my Riccati equation, I have to take partial j partial x f of x u, but I also take partial j partial t, and this is the, s, the one that gives me x bar transpose s dot 
x bar. In the, in the derivation, this extra term popped up because j depends on t. Okay, but it, so what would have broken this, right? I mean, I, so there's time dependence, you know, everywhere. That's, we were, we were worried, I was worried, that this was gonna break everything about how we know how to do things. But at every instant in time, we have our same familiar Riccati equation. You know, the, it's a quadratic in S, it's a hard thing, okay. But at every instant, it's a, it's a familiar equation. And it gives me now a differential equation, a matrix differential equation, which I have to numerically, numerically integrate in order to, make, to find the solution. And I want to find the positive definite solution, right? So, um, <clears throat> so I actually need, I can take as initial conditions, the, uh, the problem I've written here, the initial conditions would be to say that the cost to go is zero at, time, at the final time. And then I start integrating this backwards and it'll come to the, Eventually, you know, it'll, it'll integrate back to time zero. Sorry, okay. Why do I integrate backwards in time? This is negative s dot. So this is actually an equation that tells me how it evolves backwards in time. I just put the negative in front of there. But the reason I, I want it to go there is because I know what its solution should be at the final time. That's the trivial one. The cost to go at the time final when there's no more cost is zero. If you choose, you can add a final cost too. You can say um, Q final, you can add an extra term that says I, at the end I want to have a quadratic cost in, in X. And you could set your final condition to, uh, to that. But that would just be a terminal cost. Sometimes people in a finite horizon problem will add a terminal cost. Saying when you're done integrating, just to have this one time boom cost. And that would be the initial conditions of this. Okay, but the, it's the final condition that we understand and we have to, solving backwards in time, just like the, um, you know, the grid world solved sort of backwards in time, Bellman worked backwards in time, we're integrating backwards in time to figure this out. It's actually, uh, it's interesting to make it work for the glider because the glider is a numerically, I mean, it's, it's on the boundary of being able to work for control. If I even just integrate this equation with an error controlled integrator, if I put it in and say integrate this carefully, then you can find, you can find that it will, the, you know, this S should be positive, definite, and symmetric for all time. But small numerical artifacts can creep in here and it'll actually lose positive definiteness instantaneously. So I had to actually integrate the square root form of this equation. There's a, there's a fancier way to integrate this that even through the ODE solver is by definition uh, positive definite, right? But this is just, a, this is the stuff of now a differential matrix equation. Does that make sense? The tools are very similar but now I have a, a S as a function of time. And that's why you'll see all these pictures, all these pictures of funnels and the like, where before, for the original, maybe I can even draw, for the original <coughs> pendulum, I've got my colored chalk here. It was very interesting to draw these ellipses, right? This ellipse was a, a level set where I said equals like some constant. These were the level sets of the cost to go for the infinite horizon. Now I have a time varying coordinate system and a time varying S. So what I get is a whole you know, tube, if you will, of these ellipsoid, of these level sets that move backwards along the trajectory. If I'm coming from here, I have a whole family of these level sets that, that at you, the, where the level set is depends on what time it is. The center of it depends on the coordinate system. It's X bar in the new case, right? So where the center of that ellipse is 
depends on the time. And then the, the size of the ellipse and the shape of the ellipse depends on time too. That's why you get all these pictures, which I, did I remember to put one up, of, of ellipses going over time. Those are the level sets of the LQR cost to go. It's almost, this is a slight embellishment on that, okay? Interestingly, the blue in this picture, this is for perching, the blue in this picture is the set of, uh, of simulations that actually get to the perch. And the gray is the set of things we can verify as a sublevel set of that, of that ellipse. So we'll talk about verification in a second too. But the story is the same, just like there could have been some trajectories that were outside this that get to the perch, but we, to the origin, but uh, you know, we're gonna find a guaranteed inner approximation by looking at level sets of this quadratic Lyapunov function. Okay, so how does that, um, how does S change over time, right? So, <clears throat> well, um, let's even say first, so I'm, I'm, I just made a connection to stability. Let's relate this to stability. What can we say about um, this new S of T in terms of uh, the tools of Lyapunov, right? To what extent is this trajectory being stabilized. So let's think about what it means to be a time varying Lyapunov function. So, you know, our original Lyapunov conditions, we said this. for the time invariant. Now we can generalize this and talk about um, stability with a time varying Lyapunov function. The easiest form of this is to say that x, when x is zero for all t, it equals zero. And that form is actually general enough that you can change coordinates and stuff to make that um, pretty gen general. Okay, but that's, that's just the easiest form. And again, for all x and for all t. Now, what does v dot of x look like? If v of x depends on time, then I, I have partial v partial x, f of x, but I also have direct change the time dependence in V. I want this thing to be less than zero. All of the same machinery holds, you know, if, if, this, if these conditions hold for all t, then even if t, even if the function changes as a function of time, if it's basically, if it's always going downhill, even if the function's changing, right, if the total thing is going downhill, which includes the rate it's going downhill of the current shape and the rate it's changing, if that whole thing is going downhill, then I'm still gonna get to the bottom of the hill. And it's just a strict generalization of what we've talked about before. It allows you to have these time varying um, terms. So my J of XT, because my costs were positive, which was X bar S of T, X bar, can be a Lyapunov function
for the linear system, of course, right? For the time varying linear system. With the one subtlety being that I, I want this to go for all t. And my math originally I wrote till t final. I just need x of t um, to go to, let's say, a fixed point, x star for all t greater than t final, let's say. As long as I go to a fixed point at the end of my trajectory, then I can talk about stability. Stability is fundamentally a, a notion of what happens as time goes to infinity, right? I often say, like, stabilize a trajectory. That only makes sense if the trajectory is defined until time goes to infinity. The word stability implies time goes to infinity. In perching, the only way that's actually stabilizing a trajectory is if the, I simulate the perch and I hang on the perch. And, uh, so it's a little bit of a, um, a, a bad name for it. Trajectory regulator doesn't sound as cool. But, but, it, but stability is a precise thing and should be respected. <laughs> OK. <clears throat> so for the linear system, the cost to go, again, even though it's time varying, is a Lyapunov function. I expect to be able to go downhill on my cost to go, even though this level set is moving, if I start a trajectory inside somewhere in that ellipse, I'm gonna, the, the function I'm tracking is moving, but that's okay. I still have a guarantee that the value of that moving function is going down. It's only going down. And if at the end it's going to zero, then I've got a proof. Even though I'm moving through time, my coordinate systems are changing, my A and B matrices are changing, I still say, there's a function that I'm going downhill on, and it'll take me home. Right? All the tools work. Any questions about that? Yes? So if you start to see three hundred twenty minutes like that, is that gonna be true or you know, how do you know that you're not going to go from one time step to the other, like that just land right outside of the next level set and yeah. then you go to the That's a great question. Okay, so um, yeah, so so the question is if I'm numerically integrating it, then I've made a, some I have to make some discrete time approximation. How do I know that I'm gonna I don't jump outside of my level set? Yeah, that's a real thing. So you either need to ask for robust level sets that would um, that would guarantee this, or you could actually put the dynamics of your integrator in and certify there is a discrete time LQR, right? And the dynamics of your of a discrete time integrator are exact. You know, for some linearization of those dynamics, you could you can handle it exactly if you choose to put the dynamics of your integrator into the under test. Yeah, but that's unsatisfying because you really want the real robot to do it, right? Um, at some point, uh, continuous is actually more beautiful, right? You can't, if I have a function that, that I have a guarantee I'm going downhill, I can never jump past some threshold in continuous time. And physics is continuous time, right? So a lot of the things are more beautiful in continuous time, but the discrete time case will work for that. Yes? No, that's great. That's great. Okay. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So the question is, how is it not possible that I drift, that I could construct a Lyapunov function that drifts off to infinity? I mean, ultimately, I've picked a function. This is partly why I've protected myself by choosing the easy for all t. I say that v0 of t is equal to 0. I guess that's what's holding it in place in this form. There are more general ways to write this, but it's easy to see, I guess, in that one. Yeah. Um, but the, but the machinery, again, is um, if you propose a Lyapunov function, it implies this. There are certainly functions that don't mat match this criteria that I could, yeah, that could walk off to infinity. Great questions. Yes? Any more?
Okay, let me ask you a question. You see these, these, um, these funnels, they're getting bigger and smaller over time. Why would things get bigger or smaller over time? I'll do it over here. I mean, first, we actually need to convince yourself that S can even get bigger or smaller. That seems almost, almost a contradiction on the face of it. It's supposed to be going downhill, right? So if S dot's getting bigger, how is that allowed? Do you have a sense for why these things would shrink or grow? There's a version of it that involves the nonlinear dynamics, but you don't even need the nonlinear dynamics. Yeah? Uh, the Abenau function is also dependent on your state. Yep. So what would change, what, what property of a state would make it get bigger or smaller? Okay, yeah, yeah. So, so the idea is like maybe there's some um, energy, high energy states or something that would cause things to, to be more uh, explosive or something like that. I think that's close. That's close. That's on the right track for sure. Did you have? Uh, it's moving faster. If it's moving faster? Yeah, yeah, no, that's cool. That's good. That's good intuition. So, um, yeah, so, so maybe if it's moving faster, then somehow I'm, things are expanding or something like this. Ultimately, it's, it can't be a property of only the, the plant. It has to be a property of the control plus the plant. So the way I think of it is, I, th I think both of what, what you said are, are both true, but it's a function of the ability of the controller to, con to regulate, I think, which, which you know, may be compromised by high energy or high velocity, but ultimately there's, <clears throat> in my mind, there's a tension, there's instability in the plant that's trying to push trajectories away from each other, and there's stabilizing control that's trying to pull things back, right? So if things are expanding, that means at least temporarily the world is winning, right? So this is like maybe an area of low control authority. But if I'm able to bring things together, right, then this is, you know, higher control authority. This is where my control is, is causing convergence. This is divergence. Trajectories are diverging, let's say. What's super interesting is that even if your system is losing sometimes, you can still stabilize the trajectory. So there are cases I'll, go, I'll work through a specific one that I like, right? Certainly cases in perching where there's times where your control authority is limited in the short term. But it's okay because you'll catch yourself later. In fact, I, maybe the, one of the best examples of that maybe would be uh, the hopping robots that we'll talk about in some detail later. But <clears throat> imagine that the hopping robots are basically just throwing themselves through the air. And there's a moment where they've given up a lot of, uh, of their authority, right? But when the foot comes back down, they've got a chance to correct any wrongs that happened in the ballistic phase. That whole cycle can be stable, even if the instantaneously physics is in control. As long as over a cycle, I have enough authority to, to correct myself. I think another good example of this is if you think about the cart pull, You can run trajectory optimization to swing up the cart pole, and you can run time-varying LQR to stabilize that trajectory. But the, 
purple is a finicky thing in some states, right? So if I have my dynamics going this way, <clears throat> there's a state, there's a set of states where the, I mean, and you have to pass through this set of states to get from down to up. There's a set of states where the pole is exactly horizontal, okay? If you look at, if I write the equations with all of the coefficients set to one, okay, even gravity, that's pretty evil, but uh, keeps the things cleaner here. Theta dot squared sine theta equals f x double dot cosine theta plus theta double dot plus sine theta equals zero, right? When cosine theta equals zero at pi over two there, this term disappears, this term disappears, you know, this is one, this is one. I have an equation sitting there saying theta double dot equals negative one, and I've got nothing I can do. None of my control actions, my force, this is my actuator, right? This is my control input. Instantaneously, that pendulum is just listening to gravity. It's not listening to me whatsoever. Nothing I can do with my cart is gonna change that instantaneously. So in practice, what you'll see with, if you plot the level sets of the cost to go for the cart pole, you'll see these choke points, and they can be numerically difficult to deal with actually, right? This is when cosine theta is approximately equal to zero. You see a loss of control authority, and you just kinda have to wing it through that, that part of state space and know that when you get back over here, then you've got enough control authority to get it up to the top and catch yourself at the top. So this S, even looking at the contours of S, even if you don't do any uh, fancy Lyapunov analysis, even looking at the size of S and how it changes and how it changes shape can tell you something about the uh, sensitivity of your system to those per perturbations, right? If I were to perturb myself in this area, then what does it mean to have a level set here, right? A small perturbation can cause a larger cost to go. Over here, a small perturbation ma makes less of a change in the cost to go. But when I have a narrow level set, that means the cost to go, that means S is large. Cost to goes are, are large, and that's a high sensitivity area. It's a very interesting way to sort of examine the controllability um, you know, the control authority that your, your system has. Now the way you can do verification is using all the same sums of squares tools, right? You can do verification by just asking, when does my cost to go derived for the linear system work for the nonlinear system? Same thing we did before, right? <clears throat> what we did before would be the analog of that would be to say if v dot if v of x of t is less than some scalar, then that implies that v dot of x of t is less than or equal to zero. So if I look at the contours of my cost to go, that when I'm inside the contours, I want to be going downhill, right? That the V dot is less than zero. It turns out there's an important general, once you're in the land of time varying Lyapunov functions, there's an important generalization of this. It's a, well, only a strict generalization. You can allow your level set to be time varying. And you can still ensure all of the Lyapunov conditions as long as you're going downhill faster than the level set changes. Take a minute to, it, it, maybe after class you might think that through, make sure you're happy with it, but 
Um, you'll see in the trajectory case, we generalize it slightly to do this. So that allows you to stretch and shrink your level sets. But as long, again, as your level, if you're going downhill faster than your level set is growing or shrinking, then you're still good. And this can all work using sums of squares. Now, actually, your question about integration uh, is, is, is interesting when you think about how do I verify this for all t with sums of squares. You can represent, you know, you can, there's a couple of different ways you can do that. You can try to have your solutions, your Lyapunov functions be po piecewise polynomial in time, right? All your, the, everything is a polynomial still, and that works. But we have always said, Sums of squares is about dealing with the uh, high dimensional stuff and you know, like I, where I can't sample and I wanna have an explicit thing. Time is one dimension, I can just sample. So I just check at a bunch of points in time, typically. Either one can work, okay. But that's how we get these pretty awesome, um, you know, verifications of, uh, of trajectory type stability. And they work for, you know, for perching, but for, for bigger things too. And you can imagine then using that in a library to say, I know that I could execute this maneuver. This was, you know, to, to your question about, oh, I can't trajectory optimization handle everything, right? Well, I, if I've pre-offline done trajectory optimization, and I know it's, I don't have to worry about it converging or not. I, offline it converged, I can certify it and be confident to apply it online if I landed it inside its funnel, right? There's a bunch of cool details there. I, I sense that you guys are not interested in those details right now. <laughs> but, but you can tell me, yeah. Any other questions about that? Yeah. So you mentioned earlier that sometimes you have a very high number of reads and you don't have access to, so let's say you have multiple of those reads and some are less considered than the other ones. Would it make sense to That's a great question. I'll, I'll repeat it for the camera here, but so the question is if, if, there, if there's regions of sensitivity, which I, I'll embellish a little bit, are exposed by the Riccati equations. It's really the LQR that's exposing that lack of sensitivity. And it wasn't available just on X. It was something about the gradient, or the linearization around X that told me about that sensitivity. Could I use that in my trajectory optimization to find better trajectories? Yes. Uh, but it, it often involves somehow, I mean, you either need to look at an approximation of the, of the Lyapunov, of the Riccati equation solution, or, but somehow look at the linearization. I think you, you have to look at more than just F at a particular X. You have to put in a, something about the gradient of F with respect to X and gradient of F with respect to U into your cost function. The full glory, you can actually, um, and we have done this, it's gone, but you remember my Riccati differential equation? I can actually have S be a decision variable and have it solve for a trajectory in X, U, and S all at the same time so that you can use S as part of your cost function. That's a great question, right? That would be a way to do, to try to find, uh, people talk about it as convergent planning or divergent, or I guess yeah, everybody wants convergent planning planning that are low sensitivity trajectories. People talk about trying to find trajectories that are even open loop stable with that kind of approach. That's a great, um, great idea. Let me, let me just sneak in one more idea, even though you may or may not, I'm interested. So um, it turns out that you can actually numerically, you can rarely satisfy either of these conditions for all X less than, you know, for all x and t, especially if the trajectory that you're stabilizing is the result of a numerical trajectory optimization, because the dynamics are actually, if you made it some numerical approximation, it's actually not a perfect 
feasible trajectory. There's numerical errors just even at the zero, you know, of my coordinate system. So it's an, for many applications, it's actually enough to just say when I'm on the boundary, I'm going in without saying that I'm going for the entire interior, I'm going downhill. If you just say you're going downhill at the boundary, then that's enough to give you an invariance argument, saying that if I started inside the set, I won't leave the set. And it doesn't require that you go downhill right, at the uh, right to the origin and converge perfectly, because that's often not possible. It's also not possible if the wind is blowing or something like that. So actually, a lot of times we will try to verify Like in, we verify that for all of the states outside some ellipse, I'm going downhill, but inside I leave some region where it's okay. I just I'm not gonna, I'm just going to claim that I converge to this inner tube, but not all the way to the origin because converging to the origin is often too much to ask. It's the same if you remember that picture where I showed the cube where the fixed point disappeared because of all the because of the additive invariant or the additive noise. Yeah, same thing. So oftentimes it's enough to just say if I'm on the boundary, I'm going inside. Actually, you know, Valerie and I were talking about earlier. So this is one of the ways that people combine reinforcement learning with control, actually. There's a great idea in safe reinforcement learning out there. If I have a controller designed with all the great tools from class that I've somehow certified to say that I know it's going to go downhill. You can be, you know, and you've certified it perfectly at the boundary and you're in continuous time and everything's beautiful. Feel free to do RL inside there. You can do whatever you want inside there. As long as when you get to the boundary, you're willing to turn on my guaranteed safe controller, then you can still guarantee that the system won't explode. That's one of the big ideas that people use to combine, learn, to say they verify a, or they have safe reinforcement learning is they have a catcher controller that's verified and its conditions are satisfied on the boundary and you only have to turn on your safety controller when you get to the boundary. Okay, cool. So this is the fully LQR case. The LQR case doesn't capture in, uh, any constraints if you have torque limits. It doesn't handle the nonlinear dynamics directly. It's all based on the linearization, but it's guaranteed to be, it's, it's got a, you know, the next best thing to a closed form solution. It's, it's a, you know, it works if your system is stabilizable, locally stabilizable. But we also talked about, well, what if you just use trajectory optimization in the loop, right? We do model, model predictive control. What does that work? How does that work? So remember the, the plan is to do trajectory optimization. find my initial x star u star. I'll do it in discrete time where it's clear. Execute u star 0. Throw the rest away. Let the dynamics evolve for one step. And then repeat. Okay. This is potentially risky business in the full glory of trajectory optimization. But in the particular case of linear MPC, where my dynamics are even time varying linear. And 
and my cost function is convex. plus additional constraints, additional convex constraints, let's say linear constraints, just to be careful. Now this problem I can solve reliably. There's this, if, if, um, if a solution exists, it's a convex optimization, I will find it if it exists, okay? So at least my trajectory optimization should succeed. I can definitely execute u0. If my model is pretty good, then I can, you know, when I execute, I should be in a position to, uh, um, to solve again. But now this is where it gets really interesting, okay? If I started to add constraints, and I've got a, uh, trajectory optimization that's being solved in a loop like this. One of the big questions you need to ask yourself is could I, e even though I can solve the optimization problem as long as it's feasible, is there ever a chance that in this loop, when I come around to the next trajectory optimization, I've accidentally made a mistake? I've made a decision prematurely that made it so suddenly I'm infeasible in a future time. Okay? In particular, when you're doing this in receding horizon control, you should think about you know, time going this way. And, my f and if I'm solving a finite horizon optimal control problem, and then I execute for one step. And I solve, again, an n step optimal control problem, but now starting at one. There's a couple things that happen. If you think about how you write down the dynamics constraints and the cost and everything, there's a dynamic constraint here and a one-step cost that is being removed from the optimization problem, right? Removing an, a cost or a constraint from the optimization problem is no problem. That only makes the problem easier. But I'm also adding a new cost and a new constraint to the end as I've shifted forward. So the potential hazard here is that if I've made a decision only looking, thinking n into the future, could I have ever made a mistake so that when I now you know, look one farther into the future, this step was infeasible? That's what you want to avoid. The name for trying to avoid this is achieving recursive feasibility. Now, this is what's going to take, one, just to say it again, this is what's going to take trajectory optimization, which is potentially a, um, a more f a harder to verify property, and actually allow us to do, give guarantees that if I solve trajectory optimization on every step, then I can actually guarantee the system will continue to solve correctly and give me a stabilizing controller. It's one of the properties necessary. So there are a number of good ways to think about recursive feasibility. Um, <clears throat> one of the simplest ones, so let's think about specifically recursive feasibility in the LQR cost, the constrained LQR problem. So if I have, could be time varying. I'm going to minimize um, a 
sum from n <clears throat> zero to capital N, x bar If I'm going to solve this problem and then shift things one into the future, I really want to make sure that I haven't violated any constraints, especially if I have, for instance, um, let's say for all x or for all n, xn less than 2. That would be a, a tricky thing, right? I don't want to run into the wall or something like this. I don't want to make a decision because I've only thought short, a short time into the future that would cause me to end up in a state that would inevitably run into the wall. Or similarly, the control actions are less hard to work with, but those are the kind of constraints that you could potentially trip and cause and lose this ability to run trajectory optimization on the fly. Here's the simplest recipe that often works. for recursive feasibility. Add an artificial extra constraint saying that x at capital N is at the, is at the goal, is at the origin. Let's just think that through. Okay, so if I'm saying, uh, <clears throat> you know, I'm, I'm driving my car, goal is to be down the middle of the highway, right? I'm gonna, uh, you know, avoid some obstacles. I'm gonna maybe make my ride smooth for my passenger, whatever the objective function is, right? But I'm only gonna think three seconds into the future. That's all I've got the budget for, okay? A good idea would be to say, I'll do whatever I can to optimize the ride for the passenger, but at the end of my horizon, I'm going to be in the middle of the lane. Absolutely. At the end of that time, I'm going to be darn sure I'm in the middle of the lane so that I don't, like, you know, optimize my ride for my passenger and find out, like, it, I left myself in some place where I was just about to drive off the road because I wasn't thinking far enough in the future. If you take some trick like this that guarantees that when I solve the problem one step farther into the future, I will de definitely have a feasible solution, then that's the kind of thing you need to do for recursive feasibility. Okay. In particular, the solution to the problem at um, time zero, let's call it x star um, at time zero, u star time zero. There is a solution, there's a, I can construct from this solution a feasible solution to the next problem. So I'm going to construct a new trajectory where I'm going to take I get the plus one, or is it plus one or minus one? Plus one, I guess. Yeah, the KP, plus one. Okay, I'm gonna just copy. So I take my blue, my blue area here. I've solved this problem for blue. I'm gonna take the entire segment here and reuse that again for this segment and know that I can just tack on k hat one of n equals zero and have a feasible solution to the system. I can guarantee that this new constructed trajectory, which was built out of the one I've previously solved, is going to be a potential solution, a feasible solution to the next problem. Because I'm in the world of convex optimization, if I know there's at least one feasible solution, and I now add new costs and constraints, I, can, I, I, I have a feasible solution. I can only do better, but I'm guaranteed to continue to have a, a feasible solution. Okay. 
the notion of recursive feasibility. You could do much fancier things. For instance, if you were to use your sums of squares to come up with a region <coughs> that you knew was good for the infinite horizon, and we're just happy to land, <coughs> excuse me, land in the region of attraction of my infinite horizon controller, you could use that as a less conservative constraint than demanding you're inside here. I just, just demand you're inside the region of attraction for LQR, for instance. That would be a more expressive way to do this. Okay. If you do this, then the total cost from the optimization problem is a Lyapunov function. By the conditions I just said, you can guarantee the Lyapunov conditions in discrete time are just that it goes downhill on each step. Even if I'm solving only n steps in the future, I can use the cost. And even if I don't have an expression, I don't have a polynomial, I don't have anything. I just got, you solve an optimization to evaluate V, right? You can still say that, my, that the solution to that optimization problem is going to go downhill every time I move forward. It's guaranteed to be feasible by, recur by, by our careful design. And I'm guaranteed to actually stabilize the system. So you can turn, you can make, even if your inner loop is not a closed form solution from LQR, it's a numerical recipe, you can still make use of the Apanov tools to guarantee that it's going to work, that's going to stabilize your system. You can't do sums of squares on it, which is uh, yeah, bad. But uh, uh, so it's hard to, to find its region of attraction. But you can say for the linear system, it's, it is stabilizable. Or a robust version of the, there's there's variants of that where you can talk about explicit robustness. Linear systems plus or minus some delta, things like that. OK, so let me step back since we're wrapping up a bunch of stuff here. OK. I'll even go through here what I said. So we talked about how powerful trajectory optimization is. But you solve your trajectory optimization, the plane doesn't land on the perch. Right? It just doesn't work. So today we talked about what it takes to stabilize it. We talked about the LQR approach to it and this notion that you can still do linear optimal control in the vicinity of a trajectory. LQR is, I don't want to overly emphasize LQR. There's all kinds of, there's different objectives you can put on a linear system that are convex. LQR is the one we've talked about. But in general, linear optimal control can be applied to a linearization, a time-varying linearization along a trajectory. And you can do great things. And that can stay, then you hit the perch. Right? You go from missing the perch to hitting the perch. If you go even farther, you can go into verifying that you will hit the perch, even for the nonlinear system. Right? We talked about it. Uh, the, the only way I can really do that uh, is for the closed form solutions that you get out of LQR. I don't know how to do that for the MPC unless you make, there's, there's ways, but the short version is that you, it's not as easy to do with MPC. But if you do choose to use trajectory optimization in the inner loop, that's more powerful. It can handle constraints, it can handle other things, and you can guarantee that it will stabilize the linear system or, the, or some, some extra thing. It's hard to certify it for the original nonlinear system. But altogether, this is a pretty powerful pipeline. You can do offline trajectory design and not worry about it failing at runtime. You can certify it, you can put it on, and you can use these as a library of possible notions that work. Or you can take your chances and solve the trajectory optimization online uh, for the nonlinear system. People do that too. Any big questions on that? Okay, happy spring break, happy St. Patty's Day, happy St. Spring break. I'll look forward to your project proposals.